This is rental car number 145, and today I'm driving the 2020 Nissan Maxima SL. This is a full-size car that I've driven quite a few times. I think I've reviewed the 2017, 2018, 2019, and now the 2020. I love them all. They're great cars, but my take on this is that it's not the most interesting vehicle out there. I really wish Nissan would do a nice refresh, because I think we could use with a little bit more styling. But that's just my take. I'll walk you through the car and you can kind of form your own opinion. So let's start with the basics. This is the SL trim level, which retails for about $38,000. There's actually six trims. So this is middle of the pack, but don't worry, there's still plenty of toys to talk about. It's also in super black with charcoal leather interior, which I kind of like quite a bit. Now under the hood, we have a uh, 3.5 liter 24 valve v6 engine you also get yourself a cvt a continuously variable transmission 300 horsepower at 6400 rpms which is not bad now zero to 60 times are not readily available on the sv but the platinum trim goes zero to 60 in 5.7 seconds with a top speed of around 133 and uh, although i didn't get out my stopwatch i felt like the sv is pretty close to that um, fuel economy is uh, pretty good. Now this takes regular unleaded gas and your uh, fuel tank is actually located on the driver's side of the vehicle, if you care. You get 20 miles per gallon in the city, 30 on the highway with a combined rating of 24, and that fuel tank will hold 18 gallons of fuel. So let's talk about what it's actually like to drive the 2020 Maxima. At low speeds, I really like it. It's easy to maneuver, uh, super easy to park, and very responsive. Meaning when you do want to make a tight turn, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn almost instantly when you hit that steering wheel to the right or left, which isn't true with every vehicle. At higher speeds, I felt super comfortable. I ran around some quite long curves on the interstate, uh, going pretty fast, and I didn't feel like the car was going to slip by any means. So that's a big two thumbs up in my book. Acceleration is also pretty good. I mean, uh, 300 horsepower is quite a bit on a sedan like this, and you feel every little bit of it. So acceleration from a dead stop is fantastic, and I didn't notice much of a delay when I was trying to accelerate while moving. So just for example, traveling down the road, maybe like 40 miles an hour, and then you need to get a little boost of speed so you can pass the car in front of you. Well, as soon as you hit that accelerator pedal, it's going to jerk forward within probably about a second, second and a half, which is great for a vehicle this price point. Last thing I think we should touch on is cabin noise. Uh, this is where I think the Maxima excels quite a bit. So at low and high speeds, I didn't really notice exterior noise at all. And I never felt like I had to bump up the volume on my podcast or audiobook. It's just a quiet ride, which is fantastic for a vehicle at this price point. So handling, acceleration, and cabin noise, I was actually pretty impressed. I liked it quite a bit. So here's the key fob. Nissan's standard key, their logo on the top, remote start, Lock, unlock, hatch release, and a panic button. Let's press that right now. And there is an actual physical key hidden inside here. Let me show that real quick. There's just a small switch on the back. You press that switch down, and then the key slides right out. I kind of like that it's a golden color. I don't know, it's a nice touch. And since we have a key fob, it's pretty light, by the way. I don't know if you'll like that or not, but it is an oval shape, which always makes it feel really comfortable in my pocket. So that's a positive thing. And then, you know, I have the extra rental car stuff attached to it. Put that to the side. The push button start is down here on the dash. Pretty easy to reach and uh, it illuminates kind of faintly when the car is on. Here's the steering wheel setup. On the left hand side we have controls to adjust the volume and interact with the screen up here in the gauge cluster. I'll show you that in a second. On the right hand side we have our cruise controls. This car does have adaptive cruise control. That's why you see some additional uh, buttons. Uh, that just means that the car is going to match the speed of the vehicle in front of you. It's actually really nice. And then down below here we have our virtual assistant button and a button to hang up and answer phone calls. Up above, we have two stalks with uh, all the controls you'd expect, and then kind of a nice gauge cluster up top. On the left-hand side, we have RPMs and a temperature gauge. On the right-hand side, we have our speedometer, and our fuel gauge, and then a pretty decent-sized screen in the middle. Let me just show you some of the basics. Up here, the icons over here tell us that we have our lane departure assistant technology on. That just means the steering wheel is going to vibrate if you sort of veer out of your lane. You got a clock and the speed limit, which automatically updates depending on where you're driving, and the temperature outside shows that the car is in park, 
This car has uh, $18,000, 18000 dollars 18,000 miles on the odometer, and we can go about 381 miles before we run out of fuel. The screen in the center is actually adjustable, so you can use this control right here to navigate through the menu structures. So right here we're on a compass. We have our audio screen, a home screen with a digital speedometer, setup screen, warnings about the vehicle. I am in sport mode right now, so that you get a nice kind of well, more aggressive screen for that. Uh, tire pressure, speed limit signs, which is always fun. It's, it's actually pretty accurate too as you drive around town. And then your driving aid and your fuel economy screens. And then just a, a general information screen that I had on at the beginning. This shows things like your miles per gallon, how far you're driving on a trip counter, stuff like that. So a nice screen with lots of different functionality. Um, I love this. I like to be able to adjust things in the gauge cluster just to keep things kind of fresh. So uh, all in all, pretty good screen here. Over to the left, things get a little bit more boring. Window controls, door locks, mirror controls right here. Up on the dash, we have a hatch release and uh, heated steering wheel controls. This control right here just adjusts the brightness in the gauge cluster. And then your trip reset button right there. And then I missed it, but all the way at the bottom we have standard push pedal parking brake. One other thing worth noting on this side of the vehicle is that you do get blindside detection, but it's not outside in the mirror. It's this small little light right here that illuminate in a yellowish orange color when someone's in your blind spot. And we do have premium sound on this vehicle, so that's why you see a Bose logo right there. And you get that same setup over on the passenger side as well. Up top we have a sunglass holder. Simple controls to turn on lights, and then controls to open up the sunroof. There are two, one for the front seat, one for the back. Although in the back seat, it doesn't actually open up. It's just kind of a glass roof. Uh, you also have a standard rear view mirror with some simple controls on it to uh, connect to your garage door opener. And then down below, we have our touch screen. That's where things get a little bit more interesting. Dedicated buttons on the right and left side. Although really what I've been using are the controls down here to jump through all the important parts of the menu structure. So you get a phone button, info about the car, an audio screen, map, your connections, and then a setting. Honestly, what I typically use is not the information screen. There is some stuff here, but nothing I find really, I don't know, that interesting. I mean, look, Eco Drive report. It's just a little bit dull. But thankfully, it's pretty easy to connect your phone via Bluetooth, so and then... You can listen to your podcasts and audiobooks, at least that's what I do. And the map feature seems to work pretty well. Nice big screen, bright colors, pretty responsive when you want to jump to different menus. But only one. But not the most, I'd say, up to date screen I've seen. It feels slightly dated, but works pretty effectively. Down below there we have our climate controls, simple buttons to adjust the defrosters, the fan, and the temperature, along with the digital readout to show you exactly how you're setting the, uh, the temperature. Push button start right down here, and then a gear shift wrapped in leather, shifts those gears really nicely. And two things about this, one, you shift it in drive, you can pop it over to the left and shift those gears manually if you want to. And then when you put the car in reverse, you do get a nice big rear view camera display. If you'll notice, it's kind of grainy, so it's not the sharpest of displays, but you get guides to show you where you're going. And this is a nice big screen, so you can see well, pretty well behind the vehicle while you're reversing. Below there you have a nice storage cutout with two USB ports, type C, normal, and an auxiliary jack. And then this is a pretty deep area, so here's my cell. It fits pretty comfortably down in there, although it's not a place I'd probably keep it. I'm going to forget about it. Behind there we have two cup holders and then some controls back here. So you do have a dial to adjust the touchscreen up here along with some pretty simple controls above it to get where you need to go in the menu structures. Though quite honestly, I've been actually reaching forward and touching the screen. I, I haven't even used this once. Behind there, we have a button to turn on and off traction control, and then your sport mode button. Kind of fun, when you do press sport mode, you get a different screen that pops up in the gauge cluster, just to tell you that you're about to go a little bit faster. Next to there, we have your heated seat controls with high and low settings, and then a pretty large center armrest with a 
Nice size storage area inside and a power port right there, but no USB ports down there. Although you do get a, a felt lining, which feels nice, but if you can notice, it's already accumulating a bunch of these kind of dirt down there. All right, I jumped in the passenger seat and uh, changed pants if you're keeping track. Not a whole lot of amenities over here. You have uh, your window controls and door locks, door latch, door lock, and then your glove box. Actually a pretty large size. You have a little pocket type thing right here in the door to keep your owner's manual, and then a pretty deep area right here to keep everything else. And Nissan gives you a ton of owner's manuals, so you're gonna need the extra space. All right, I jumped in the back seat. I actually pushed this driver's seat back further than I normally do. And despite that, I still have a good amount of leg room. I'd say maybe three or four inches between my knees and the back of that seat. Although, what isn't good is height clearance. Let me turn the camera around. So my head is actually hitting the top of this and I'm gonna have to slouch down quite a bit to sit back here comfortably. And that's, that's a little bit disappointing. I don't think that was like that on the past Nissan Maximas that I've driven. So keep that in mind. Backseat passengers are going to have to be short to be comfortable. But there are some amenities back here worth talking about. You get pockets on the back of both seats, which is pretty nice. This is also super soft leather. This is actually really impressive. You also get some dedicated vents back here and then two USB ports, one type C, one old fashioned. And then, you know, window controls, door lock, door latch, a handle up here, and then a reading light over here. And you get that same setup on the other side. You also get a center armrest, kind of a cutout for a cell phone, and then two cup holders, that's awfully nice. And then let's look at car seat anchors. Obviously, been using a car seat today. Car seat anchors are a little bit strange. Right, so here's the icon indicating that the car seat anchor is right below. Then you have this small plastic piece right here that pulls out really easily, by the way. And then you can see the car seat. It's completely revealed right here. So it should be pretty easy to install a car seat back here, which is a big, big plus in my book. So let's close things out by opening up the trunk and taking a look at the storage space back here. You do get a nice large space, although it's not perfectly rectangular because that wheel well does infringe on the space ever so slightly. Uh, but there's still enough room back here for your odds and ends. Also, underneath the floor of this area, there is a spare tire, which is fantastic. Not every manufacturer is giving those to you anymore. Uh, thinking about Kia specifically, they only give you a flat tire kit, not actually a spare tire. Uh, so that's a great thing for uh, Nissan to keep doing. Also, those rear seats do fold down. You just have to pull up on these two little latches right here, and then the seats fold down pretty effortlessly, and you're left with a bigger space to take advantage of. Although, that opening between the trunk and the cabin of the vehicle is kind of small, so um, don't expect to get huge objects back here. But all in all, decent storage space for a uh, sedan like this one. All right, so that's pretty much everything end-to-end -end on the 2020 Nissan Maxima SL. You know, I drive Maximus quite often because they are an Enterprise staple. There's usually at least one on the Enterprise lot, and uh, I'm never disappointed to get one. So with that being said, you won't be surprised that uh, I'm going to give this one four stars. Look, this is a great car. Drives well. It's got updated technology. And at least the front end, I think, is styled really nicely. I just kind of find this one to be a bit boring and I wish Nissan would go through the whole thing, refresh it and give us something a little bit more exciting because there is quite a bit to like about this car. I think it just needs some new packaging. Anyway, that's just my take on the vehicle. If you think differently, please leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I hope you join me next time when I rent and review my 146th rental car. I'll see you then.